beginning of the concert or in the middle of it was it was done when folks were leaving and so often for maximum carnage yes. as Theresa May said and what it really what they're doing is they're changing the tempo which means they did some pre-operational surveillance they saw what happened in this in, the, in these types of arena 20,000 people there and then they used a device that had basically a shrapnel effect that's where they, they use the bolts and the ball bearings so they went to do absolute carnage what we what you try to do in any type of arena is well, first of all, you should try to detect any type of device if you can. And that is best done, I think, is you can do magnetometers. But bomb dogs play a very large role in this. We were talking about that with uh, Ed, uh, Ed Davis last hour, in fact. And, and so, the, again, the question is, what happens and, and, you know, how do you protect every single venue at every time? They chose this venue, so largest in Manchester, but it's not typically, you know, like the center of London, that type of exposure. So they're trying to spread their message of fear, and that's what makes this such a challenge, is how do you sustain and, and spread all the security? And Steve is actually the one who brought up the use of... of explosive sniffing dogs okay. and, and even having the presence of dogs out there right. it's a, it does act as a deterrent sure but Steve, go ahead. Mike I'm very curious to see how they got the 23 year old yeah. I mean do, do you think there is a possibility that there's a cell out there maybe the videos that they looked at what's your what's your uh, 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 educated guess on how they got that 23 year old well, so you know better than anybody else that this type of device is not made in, you know cooked up in a, in a uh, in a garage by a lone wolf it takes you, you got to have some experience right. you got to have know-how to be able to put something like this together which indicates that the individual had support right. and so a part of a cell and so the question is how do they get into the city were they there for a while you know as we recall back Back in 2005, when they had the airline bomb plot, it came from the same area. So there is an indication that perhaps there are communities here that have some type of, of affinity right. to, to um, Al-Qaeda at that point in time and now ISIS. Right. And we're going to see what the kind of radicalization is. But again, you know better than anybody else that that's flipped. And, and they get the point I believe Colonel Schaefer made earlier. There had to be someone else involved. And now they have a 23-year-old. Right. And who knows where that's going to lead. I, I want to ask you both. The, the president is in Israel right now. Israel has been dealing with this kind of terror for, for decades. What have law yeah, he's enforcement... Leaving from, he'll be leaving from Ben-Gurion Airport at, at about 8.45, 9 o'clock, and right. Ben-Gurion has arguably the best security in the world. Right, so what what has what what the U.S. law enforcement community learned from the Israelis is in terms of, you know, frontline defense against this kind of event? Well, well, keep in mind that we have not suffered a very catastrophic attack to, to this degree. Uh, I'm sure, Mike, you could uh, agree that you, we can't imagine how many have probably been prevented right. as a result of the good work of the FBI. So we've learned a lot from them, but obviously they're not going to reveal what they've learned because then they're going to be revealing their operation. But I'll point out, though, that Omar Mateen shot, I think, 49 people died mm -hmm. in, in that nightclub yeah. attack. So that's that's as catastrophic as, as this Agreed, attack, yeah. given the, the number killed. Yeah. I mean, this is this is different and strikes fear in a, in a different way, yeah. but never because of the children who were murdered. But nevertheless, that was a catastrophic attack. Yeah. Mike, Michael, I have, a, I have a question. There, there's been recent blowback um, about military-grade equipment being given and uh, to local law enforcement, right, for them to be able to prevent these kinds of attacks. Is that something that you think that blowback is unnecessary and unwarranted because local law enforcement need access to that kind of response equipment? What's your position there? So it depends upon what type of equipment you're talking about. You know, one of the things that um, the, the Army has developed in, over in Afghanistan and Iraq is the ability to disrupt a signal that's sent to a device, an improvised explosive device. They did that when they were traveling down the roads in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
the problem there, believe it or not, to utilize that in the United States, the Secret Service has that equipment, but a lot of local law enforcement do not because, believe it or not, the FCC, that there's a challenge in, in interrupting waves because the way you use it, yeah. it it's got to be coordinated, and so local don't necessarily have that ability. However, there is a lot of equipment that they do use, but, you know, at the end of the day, that's really deterrent effect, and what you really need is really good intelligence because you need to be proactive on this. And so here, New York City, NYPD, probably one of the best local intelligence shops in the nation, if not in the world. The question is how do you support that, and how do you get that information that's actionable in real time? We've had a very good run in this country, and yes, we have had attacks here, but when you consider what's been going on in Europe, we are relatively much, much safer. The question becomes how do you really continue to protect arenas like this when well, they decide to do this type of an attack. Right, because one? again, I just want to point out that, and, and this is not a, a direct comparison, but that the Manchester Arena, and then it's attached to the Victoria train station, mm -hmm. it holds about 21,000 people. It's roughly the size of Madison Square Garden. Madison mm -hmm. Square Garden attached to Penn right. Station. Mm -hmm. It's not unlike something that you would see here in the United States. And it, at Manchester Arena, they check, they, you can't take a backpack into an event like that. You can't take bottles of water, but nevertheless, yeah. you have this suicide bomber that's standing out by the, the box office. There's no way to eliminate all of the vulnerabilities. It just isn't. You know, it's not, not about eliminating risk. It's about managing it. Mm -hmm. And it's about using resources in a very smart, safe way. But again, you know, it, it is really about the information that's coming from, from the well, So what, what's the next step the United States, U.S. authorities need to take on the intelligence front to improve our intelligence uh, gathering capabilities to prevent this kind of thing? What's not happening yeah. now that needs to happen? So you, you've seen things where the, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, the, I think probably one of the more effective groups in terms of sharing intelligence back and forth. That's not as been robust as it has been in the past. I think that we need to put more money in, in terms of the state's collection capabilities, in terms of the cities like New York, like L.A., Miami. But we also need to have a better opportunity to share this information on, an, on a daily, ongoing basis. New York City does it, but a lot of places in the nation don't. And that's one of the things that we should be, continue to examine. Intelligence is really key in this. Right, and that's been a problem on the whole of Europe as well. It has been. The intelligence, the information sharing between these nations. Yeah, we saw that in the Brussels attacks. Right. When they hadn't shared a lot of the information. But, but let's also make this point, very important point. You can, there's no intelligence in the world that's going to say, stand on this corner at 3 o'clock because that's when the attack is going to happen. It just doesn't work like that. And so it's about surveillance. It's about following people. But that's about resources. It's incredibly expensive and time-consuming to try to surveil one individual. Especially analysis, because someone may get a piece of information in L.A., another one in New York, another one in Chicago. You need people to analyze that and then to bring it all together. When on the surveillance front, you could be following someone. Someone could just be sitting there for years before they do right. anything. You're absolutely right. And you never know when they're actually going to. Yeah, and, and, and some of the attacks, like in, in uh, London and in, in Paris before in Cannes, you know, when you, when you have the guy getting in a truck, but so at what moment do you sit there and say, this guy is now radicalized and he's going to turn this vehicle into a weapon? Incredibly impossible to stop. But I, I do want to point out that, today, that, that this attack in Manchester was four years to the day after that British soldier, Lee Rigby, was hacked to death outside yeah. that, that, that army barracks in South London by two extremists. So there's some timing here that's... They usually don't pay attention to, to, to dates, though. They usually, the, the memorials or, or anniversaries are something they usually don't pay attention to. Michael, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for being here this morning, Michael. My name is Daniel Brown. I'm a reporter and photographer for Business Insider. I was recently down in McAllen, Texas, uh, down the Rio Grande Valley to cover the, uh, the immigration crisis that's been going on. I reached out to the Border Patrol for that sector and tried to get a, a ride along. Finally, uh, they granted it. The Rio Grande Valley sector accounts for about 40% of the apprehensions in the United States. Uh, McAllen Station specifically is about 20% of the entire nation we catch about 300 individuals a day just in this 50 mile span of border. They first took me on a, on a boat. 
just drove up and down the Rio Grande. They're looking for crossers. Most people will cross um, on rafts or boats. They're just kind of some deflated rafts on the side of the coast there. That's from people crossing over. We get off periodically and just kind of take little trails and walk around. A lot of times they would look for tracks and see some faint ones, be like, okay, we know someone passed through here, you know, a couple days ago or a day ago or something like that. Their main job is obviously to keep the border safe and to apprehend people who are crossing illegally. But also, as they told me, um, it's a humanitarian mission as well, you know, whether it's Mexicans or, or Americans or any other citizen of the world, you know, who's passing through, they want to try to keep those people safe. That's kind of one of the difficulties of the job, is you have to switch on and off from humanitarian mission to, is this guy trying to take your life? Border Patrol agents are killed, are shot at. They find dead bodies a lot. They, you know, experience witness a lot of trauma. One agent who operates mostly on the boats, he said that, uh, you know, sometimes they'll find a raft or, or a little boat trying to get across and they'll be packed with, you know, 10 or more people or something like that. Sometimes they'll just throw a kid off uh, into the water just because they know that the agents will go for the kid right away to save them. We went up and down along the river there for a while. We ran a lot of sugar cane. It's very dense, and they were talking about the difficulties of tracking people through that, and how a lot of times people can just run into that and they'll just never find them, even if they have dogs. You cordon off this field and try to surround it. Even, a, even when we have a canine uh, assist come in so that the dog can you know, follow and smell the people, he gets overloaded. So it's, it's a big, big challenge, sugar cane. After that, we drove around for a little bit, a lot of stray dogs walking around, and the agents even said, you know, they use the dogs sometimes to kind of decipher if someone's in the area. These dogs at times will give you a heads up because with experience, you start to see that they weren't barking before, but then they begin to bark, so they'll kind of give you a little heads up that somebody's in the area or something's in the area. The people that live along the borders, you know, I spoke to some of them who have people crossing through their, their property who've been there for years, and it happens almost daily, and they'll ruin their crops. And I met one family who's shot people who crossed into their property. Those landowners, when I went and visited them, they said to come back um, in a few hours, and I did. And that's when they told me, oh, you missed it. And then they drove me out in their little four-wheeler and showed me, like, the tracks. Those tracks were, like, you know, an hour old when I took them. A lot of these people that are crossing over illegally or going to ports of entry, they've had tough lives, and they're, they're trying to escape violence. They're, they're trying to, you know, get a better life. And that's something I think that we should, we should realize and understand as a country. But at the same time, you know, people like the Border Patrol agents, their lives are at risk sometimes. People on... All sides of the issue are, are going through tough th things sometimes, and uh, I think we uh, think we need to see all aspects of that. This month, a failed missile test in North Korea led to speculation the United States might have sabotaged it through cyber warfare. It also prompted questions about whether the same thing could happen to our nuclear arsenal. But how real is this threat? News Force Luke Moretti has talked to local and international cybersecurity experts in this special report, Safeguarding the Bomb. Let there be no mistake. We shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. Ever since the U.S. dropped atomic bombs on Japan in the mid-1940s, America has come to rely on its nuclear arsenal as the backbone of homeland defense. If countries are going to have nukes, we're going to be at the top of the pack. It's estimated there are about 15,000 nuclear weapons in the world today. The U.S. and Russia hold the vast majority, around 90 percent. Both countries combined have a couple of thousand at the ready for launch within minutes. But some argue the biggest threat today is not a premeditated launch by a nuclear-armed nation, but rather the click of a mouse, a cyber attack. 
that could undermine or compromise nuclear systems. The weakness of all of this is it needs one malicious actor, either on the inside or the outside. It requires one infected computer, either ported in or already in. And that's the trigger right there. It's one button. It's been called the new wild card. The notion that a state or non-state actor could break in, interfere with, or sabotage nuclear command and control and weapons systems. This is not to say that it would be easy to hack into US nuclear weapons, but rather that it is at least theoretically possible. Uh, and I think behind the scenes increasingly it's something that the Pentagon um, and others are becoming very much aware of. Questions about the security of the military's nuclear assets came up in 2013 before the Senate Armed Services Committee. Uh, we are very concerned with, with the potential of a cyber-related attack on our nuclear command and control and on the weapon systems themselves. Just this past February, a Defense Science Board report on cyber deterrence recommended an annual assessment of the cyber resilience of the nation's nuclear deterrent against a top-tier cyber threat. I see uh, a top-tier cyber threat being um, Russia and China in particular because they have the ability uh, to threaten the existence of this nation. The threat is there. The threat is real. Shambhu Upadhyaya is a University at Buffalo professor of computer science specializing in cybersecurity. He says there are two types of attacks, physically gaining access to a system or sneaking in through cyberspace. I would say the weapons facilities, nuclear weapons facilities are very difficult to break in. He says a system is only as good as the layers of security built in. His research includes beefing up authentication to keep malicious intruders out. For example, how you type on the keyboard, you know, the typing keyboard rhythm is unique from individual to individual. You can tell just by the tap on the keyboard whether that's the same person. Exactly. Exactly. These cyber vulnerabilities, is that part of the mix? Andrew Futter, an associate professor of international politics at the University of Leicester in the United Kingdom, has written extensively about cyber threats and nuclear security. One of the big things with cyber is you don't know what you don't know. In a paper for the Royal United Services Institute for Defense and Security Studies, Futter suggests the cyber challenge also involves attempts to compromise or spoof early warning and communication systems. During a crisis, if you could spoof sensors and planners into believing an attack was underway, then this would be a way of indirectly causing it through cyber means. This is a constant game of staying one step ahead of, of the bad guys. University at Buffalo associate professor Arun Vishwanath is a cybersecurity expert. His work involves looking at vulnerabilities inside secure and non-secure facilities. There are vulnerabilities in all technologies. And anything that's connected to the internet, even if it's on a separate secure network, as long as there are computers involved, there is a possibility of malware, software, hackers getting access. Where do you see that right now, Tom? Tom Kalina is the Director of Policy with the Plowshares Fund in Washington, D.C., a global security foundation with an emphasis on reducing the spread of nuclear weapons. Imagine, in the worst case, that someone gets in and hacks our computers to tell us that there's a launch, that we're under attack, but we're really not. What do we do? How do we know? And if we think we're under attack, we launch a retaliatory strike, and we started a nuclear war. In response to questions submitted by News 4, the U.S. Strategic Command, which oversees America's nuclear forces, tells News 4 that current systems are cyber secure through a combination of the dedicated cyber forces and built-in cyber security. Additionally, nuclear command, control, and communications are comprised of interdependent systems, facilities, and platforms operating through space, air, and terrestrial domains. STRATCOM says that it is taking all available measures to protect those systems from intrusion and attack. Luke Moretti, News 4. I was there. 
storms like Hurricane Katrina historically a rare. I was there. But we stood in very long lines, it was a desperate time. Can't let them forget, that's why I wrote these rhymes. A bottle of hot water, a ride almost started, shoved and pushed forward over food, a shortage. Back up, backed up, bathrooms and toilets drank, contaminated water out of the faucet. Look up, what the? Locked up, asked a member of the National Guard, I said, why are we being held as prisoners of war? He responded, following orders, martial law. Understand, it felt more like Afghanistan and Iraq and not New Orleans. There were heroes of the storm and those of them that went too far. Pray for them, they too bad scars. Thank the Lord for the Air Force and the Coast Guard that flew helicopter and rescue missions nonstop. Got people and pets off of porches and rooftops. You may or may not even care. I was there. My name is Shelton Alexander, and I was in the Superdome during Hurricane Katrina. Well, the first time I heard about Hurricane Katrina, I was here in the parish, I was in Violet. I was at home. Gust and winds, maybe up to 200 miles per hour. We two men, cuss it, two of the last people probably left on the block. We got one neighbor that stand, and a few more, that scary man. I was thinking about Stan, I'ma go and ask my auntie, do she wanna leave? I hope she do, man, <laughs> cause if she don't, man, I'm like ready to go. When we finally made the decision to leave, we drive and then uh, all of a sudden, we get to like Airline Highway and the traffic backed up and we didn't move for like a few hours. And at that point I was like, I don't want to run out of gas right here. And I said, we have to, we'll go to the Superdome. I knew that was an option, like, you know, and I was like, if anything, it'll be maybe two days in the dome or something, it'll blow over. The National Guardsman, he, he told me to park. Like right behind the Superdome, we finally got into the line. And it took a long time because they searched every individual person, top and bottom. There's all the people waiting to get inside the Superdome. Uh, for me, I had like, uh, like a big duffel bag along with some clothing, you know, some jeans, some different the camera tapes and stuff like that. And as far as the camera's concerned, you know, being a poet and an artist traveling, like I was recording myself and I was filming stuff. And so and I was like, well, we go to the Superdome. And I just want to record that experience as well. That was that Sunday when we arrived at the Superdome. We got settled in and then early that Monday morning, all of a sudden I just hear some kind of like loud sound like boom. Then you hear some rumbling like Brr. Then the rumbling just get like boom. It didn't take long while you know, it was starting to bat and beat on top of the dome. But from that point, you know, you can see the water starting to slowly seep in. And then the hole got bigger. And then it got bigger. And then the water just start coming in and pouring in. And then it wasn't one hole. Then another hole opened up. Oh, that water starting to mash them over there now. People was like, man, what is going on? This must be serious. Like if the water getting inside the dome, they making us go move here. Move that people starting to panic. It went from feeling safe to like unsafe all at the same time. But it really wasn't high anxiety for the people just yet. I think the anxiety was more concerned for the outside. We didn't know what was going on, but uh, by that Tuesday, same kind of thing. You know, they had a lot of chaos, a lot of stuff started happening. Now people starting you know, with the food and, you know, the food start coming up short, you know, 
But we didn't really, all we heard was about, you know, the levee breaching because they didn't want to let us out. Just feeling that anxiety of being, now you feel like you're a prisoner now. Now you locked in, like, what you mean I can't leave? Like, this not a war and why am I stuck here? A lot of different things happened, you know, inside the dome. It just got real crazy. You know, the smell was really, really horrific. You're talking like after the first day, the toilets was already backed up. And not having, you know, drinking water and that, all, all that other stuff was just kind of like real, real bad. I watched a lot of people suffer. I seen people like unattended, elders like just sitting in place for like days at a time, not moving. It was hot. It was super hot. Everybody was walking around with t-shirts on. Some women in their bras, just like it didn't make a difference. It was just, it was hot. Almost had a ride behind the food. You know, people didn't know which way to go, where they were setting the food up at. And like, when things got real, real tense, you know, and we seen a shot fired. Everybody was like ducking. Like, we know what gunshots sound like in New Orleans. Maybe you're not going to see a bunch of reports of it, but I will tell you, that's something I witnessed. I didn't witness the whole commotion. All I witnessed was, the, I heard the shot, we seen somebody go down. So it was just mad chaos. Talking about Rachel, kind of like, whoa, they don't want to let us out. They about to starve us to death. Let me get out of here. I want to take my chances on the outside. I actually left uh, that Wednesday evening, you know, the day that the water was really, really, really rising. My car was on the back side of the Superdome. You'll notice they have different gate C, gate D. We tried every last gate to get out of, and all the National Guards told us, you know, you can't get out here, you can't come out this way. And so we finally came to this exit right here, and we seen all the people, then we seen an opening where we can walk out of here, and we just took for a beeline, and we just walked straight out of here. When we get to this point now, we can see from here to the street, it was like, whoa have water on the ground you know that's what people were talking about then after that I took our walk and me and a guy George we went this way and then we cut through the parking lot and we walked through the water water you know underneath there was kind of crazy because they got some low levels and so you seeing where they also could have had a current pull you underneath also like and you get sucked into the basement or something that water was flowing looked like a, a big swimming pool underneath pretty much so we finally get there, and I can see it in the distance, my truck. I'm like, whoa, man. I'm like, this truck is not submerged. And so when we got to the vehicle, we was like, cool, man. I was like, wow. Then I started doing like this. Oh, I don't have the keys. I don't have the keys. And we was like, vehicle is good. We ready to leave. And we have to go through that same journey underneath through the parking garage to go and let them know the good news. I didn't have my keys on me. I had my keys and all that inside my duffel bag. And I left my duffel bag with Cussie. And so when we got there, we ran into some of the people that I, I seen stay behind here that I left. They was like, we stand. And so like the number, when it really added up, the number was really 20. I said 19 escape. There's 19 that I helped get out of there. I made number 20 myself my peoples right here. You know what I'm saying? Where we headed at next? The refugee camp? Refugee camp. Government Street, huh? Man, it's the most amazing thing ever happened in my life. And then when I found out that Rachel Rodriguez was still alive, I'm like, man, this is crazy. Because I'm like, this is not what happened in my life. And then when I finally made it to, you know, safe ground, and I'm watching the news now, I'm like, oh, man, this is like, like, you like, I was in that. Then you see the Superdome still swelling. You see the, the convention center swelling. You know, the people coming out of the shadows. They call it survivor's guilt, like, you know what I mean? I think about all them people that I had to pass by, you know? With it being 10 years, it almost feel like it was yesterday, and then it feel like it's, it's been forever too. But I will say, it's been a lot of stress. It's been a lot of heartache. It's been a lot of pain. You know, I had my moments, you know, where I broke down. It's been really, really tough. 
post Katrina, and I couldn't breathe. I was like, man, I can't breathe. I thought it was something else. I learned that it was anxiety later, but it was real, real tough. Then after that, my mom's passed away. So the world, even to right now, for me, is totally different. Like, uh, you don't want everything to be the same. You know, uh, you want it to still feel like home. And at different times, you look around, you just like, it don't remind you of, you know, what this place was and the people not there to remind you. And so me as a poet and as an artist, and that's what I've pretty much been doing for the most part, that's been my work uh, post-Katrina is teaching creative writing uh, for primarily of alternative schools, but also regular ed schools as well. And that was my part of giving back and coming back and, 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 and coming back and rebuilding because you can rebuild the home, but you also have to rebuild the mind, the spirit, the soul. My name is Shelton Alexander, and I was there. United States Coast Guard is Semper Paratus, always ready. But no one was ready for the terrorist attacks on 9-11. The New York City Harbor looks normal today, but the empty spot in the Manhattan skyline echoes with the horror from that terrible day. On board the Coast Guard Cutter Bainbridge Island, I had the chance to speak with Vice Admiral Thad Allen. On 9-11, he was the commander in charge of the entire Atlantic area. He took me to the waters in the shadow of the Statue of Liberty, where the memories of the attack still hang in the air. Just give me a feeling of the emotions of something like that happening. Well, the emotions are extraordinary and they're overwhelming. We're in an organization that responds to emergencies every day. We kicked into that mode and I think we did what the country expected us to do. In the hours following the attack, the devastation in lower Manhattan cut off tens of thousands of frightened New Yorkers. On a normal weekday, 63,000 passengers would ride the Staten Island ferries. Nothing was normal this day. What happened in the hours after 9-11 occurred? There was an extraordinary amount of activity in the harbor. In the 18 to 24 hours following 9-11, uh, the Coast Guard working with the, the private sector operators in the harbor, our own boats and everybody else, uh, coordinated the evacuation of close to a million people off lower Manhattan, probably the largest evacuation since Dunkirk. Now, a lot of them went off in water taxis that go back and forth across these waters. Water taxis, the Staten Island ferries, tugboat operators. It was a lot of teamwork, and uh, we were a coordinating factor. We didn't provide all the boats ourselves. We were kind of like the coach. The Coast Guard went on high alert and repositioned ships throughout the fleet. I was on my ship uh, headed south for a counter-narcotics patrol down off uh, in the eastern Pacific. And we left on September 10th. September 11th, we turned around and headed north and uh, sat off the United States, which for the first time in my Coast Guard career, I actually was able to say that I was guarding the coast. And in the days after that, what did you do to try to just safeguard these waters? I mean, nobody really knew what was going to happen next. Well, within 12 hours, we had actually 12 cutters in and around New York, and a couple of them were actually anchored in the harbor with their guns uncovered, because we just didn't know what the situation was and what might happen next. That continuing threat of terrorist attacks has put the Coast Guard on the front line of homeland security. Are there a lot of eyes out here and guns out here that are pointed that probably the public isn't even aware of now, making sure that we're safe? Well, we always operate with armed boarding teams off of all of our small boats and cutters, so when you see the Coast Guard, you can assume that we're armed and ready to operate. In direct response to 9-11, the Coast Guard formed the Maritime Safety and Security Team, known better as MSST. The first of six teams was deployed here in Seattle. It's really kind of put another burden on us. We're a jack of all trades, and now we have another job that we need to do. 
Some describe them as the Coast Guard's own SWAT team, but that makes members of the MSST cringe. For while they have special training, they do all the jobs assigned to any other Coastie. Some people in the Coast Guard give me uh, some grief for calling them SWAT teams, but that's how you explain them. These are the first new complete units to come online uh, as a uh, result of 9-11. Each team consists of 100 members and up to six specially constructed boats. We have these teams of boats augmenting our normal forces. If we get a threat, their SWAT team, law enforcement powers, everything else. But if I get a threat someplace else in the country, I can stick them on one of these airplanes behind me and move them to a crisis point. To prepare to deal with any threat, the MSST went through weeks of training at the Camp Lejeune Marine Base in North Carolina. Coaching your beam. He's coming up. He's faster than you are. He's right, almost beam right now. Team members learn the specialized anti-terrorist skills they would need for their additional homeland security mission. Fully armed with sidearms as well as machine guns, the teams practice techniques for harbor security and drilled in every aspect of how to search a ship. Camp Lejeune was uh, one month of intense um, training both physically and mentally. We were up early in the morning, we went to bed late at night, but the training that we received there prepared us very well to do this job here. In a nighttime scenario, an opposing force firing blanks attacked a vessel. This final exam confronted them with one of the thousands of threats MSST You think you're a pretty good driver? Send it. Imagine having to flawlessly execute these maneuvers to keep your job. This is way beyond the fundamentals of defensive driving. Out here it is known as protective driving, which has one goal. Safely get the protectee out of the area where the, the kill zone, if you will, and to move them to a safe location as quickly and expeditiously as possible. All of the thousands of Secret Service agents and officers have to pass the basic Special Agent five-day driving course on this 550-meter long track. But even then, they are not ready to get behind the wheel of the presidential stretch limousine, known as Cadillac One or The Beast. There is advanced training for that 9,000 kilogram armored vehicle. Another special course considered perhaps harder to pass than limousine driving is for the motorcycles, which roll with sidecars in better weather. It's heavy. It's almost like 900 pounds and you're running with two wheels and they make you do things that you can't imagine that you could possibly do with that. Those are not the Secret Service's only two-wheelers. Agents and officers must also learn special techniques to drive all-terrain vehicles and even battery-powered golf carts. Besides the beast, there's also a bus known as Ground Force One. Since different countries have various curb designs, the Secret Service at its training facility had part of the streets built with two different types for drivers of full-size utility vehicles to learn how to properly run over the curves. Formal training for Secret Service drivers didn't begin until 1970, and as the vehicles have evolved, so have the training techniques. In the past, we've taught what's called threshold braking, where if your car didn't have analog brakes, you would bring the point, the wheels to the point they're almost locked up, but not quite. Some elements dealing with stability control were removed from the training as modern vehicles are more stable. And tire technology has evolved, with the rubber gripping much better nowadays on slick surfaces. Off-road training also means going into the classroom. Okay, we're keeping our eyes up, looking down range. Getting back on track, simulations are also conducted for ceremonial events such as inaugurations. When the presidential limousine moves much slower than usual, posing additional security risks. 
The Secret Service protects not only the president and vice president, their immediate family members and former presidents and first ladies, but also visiting foreign leaders and major candidates in U.S. presidential campaigns. For those in the Secret Service selected to get behind the wheel, there is a constant drive to ensure the safety of these very important passengers. Steve Herman, VOA News of the James J. Rowley Training Center in Laurel, Maryland.